We were just talking about the fact that we've seen the Department of Health and Human Services in Victoria now changing the way that these daily 24-hour uh, virus numbers are released, just getting ahead of the press conference. It's interesting, right, because does that, in your view, tell us that we shouldn't be focusing so much on the daily spikes? It could be 400 one day, 800 the next. What is the longer-term trend telling you as to whether the lockdown is working in Melbourne? All right, so uh, about a week ago to 10 days ago, the numbers were spiking hugely up and down due to batch processing. It's no fault of the DHHS, it's just because they were overloaded. And when you do a five-day moving average for that, you get some very reassuring patterns. And the first one is that the peak appeared to happen about 30 July, which makes sense because it was about seven to 10 days after we all started wearing masks. So it actually makes sense. Went flat for about a week and we're now heading down. Um, and I think the heading down, we cannot yet... Uh, say that stage four is causing us to go down. That We'll see that from Wednesday this week through to the weekend in the numbers. But what's happening is I suspect the increased infection control and aged care and the fact that we've all been anticipating stage four and probably modifying our behaviour before we're formally in it. So yet the numbers are going down. We're on the way down. It now remains to see how far we can get down in six weeks. Right. So in the meantime, you look at New Zealand, they've got 100 days without local community transmission. They obviously had some of the strictest measures in the Western world, very similar to what we're seeing in Victoria. Is the problem not the fact that we expect if we keep up these measures, we'll be able to crush the virus? What happens when you gradually reopen? Because it seems like human behaviour just can't, uh, you know, persist with, with the guidelines that are needed to keep it under control until we get a, a, an effective, widespread and long-lasting vaccine. Yeah, so there's two futures for us until the vaccine arrives or some other exit strategy. The first one is we actually go for and we achieve elimination. Now, that's looking like a big ask. That's what New Zealand's done. Because the virus is so widespread, um, it would also take coordination of New South Wales and Victoria to both go for elimination at the same time. But if we do that... Um, it will require people like myself to provide better estimates in three weeks' time so we can all, as a society, make a decision whether to go hard because it probably will mean more, longer in lockdown. And then if we do achieve that, we get into the same position as New Zealand, WA, Northern Territories, and we can live fairly normally till the virus gets here as long as quarantine's good. The other future scenario that we live in is we'll get down to low numbers and we just decide that we just cannot eliminate it as too hooked into our society now, the viruses and too many nooks and crannies. If that's the case, then I think South Korea is the best example for us to emulate, whereby with widespread mask use, very good contact tracing, uh, very good support for people who do have the infection and isolating them, much better stuff than what we're doing at the moment. We could actually live with the virus at low levels. Those are our two um, optimal scenarios going forward. I'm not sure which one we'll have a crack for yet. We'll have to wait and see. So the scenario of living with the virus at low levels, does that give rise to some meaningful level of herd immunity? Because I've looked at numbers and studies out of Florida, for example, that suggest possibly as much as almost a quarter of the population may actually have uh, antibodies that suggest herd immunity. Is that useful in any sense? Yeah. Now, this is an important question. So if Australia went for a suppression scenario, I doubt we'd get um, anywhere near the levels in Florida. We'd be sort of keeping it right down, you know, 1%, 2%, maybe even 3% infected by the time a vaccine arrives, which is not going to give you much herd immunity. Florida, and indeed the whole US, is interesting. It would appear that the actual number of people infected in the United States is probably 10 times the numbers that we see in the official data. If that's true, then about 15%, 10 to 15% of US citizens are already infected. And that means that they have a partial herd immunity. It's not a lot, but when you add that on top of, say, wearing masks, better contact tracing, better hand washing, that partial herd immunity actually helps them. So their chaotic way they've managed the virus to this point, in four to six months' time, they may see themselves having partial herd immunity, which allows them to do more than other countries. So, for example, Sweden is a similar example to that, whereby they're getting infection rates that are nowhere near complete herd immunity, but enough partial herd immunity that it helps a little bit. That's really interesting, Tony. So tell us a little bit of what the United States should do at this point when they have more than 5 million infections already right now. And it seems a little bit hopeless to expect elimination at this point. Even mitigation seems so difficult. 
All right, so let's talk about the US. So I don't condone what's happened to this point. It's had a very high mortality and morbidity burden. But given where they are now, and given it appears to be the way they're managing it, they will keep having relatively high infection rates. And when they sort of do get on top of it, and that won't be <laughs> elimination in any stretch, they will get into a position where they do have some partial herd immunity, which when combined, if they were to all use masks, say, combined with good contact tracing, they may well live with the virus quite comfortably in six to 12 months' time. It hurts me to say that because they would have got there through a very chaotic and high mortality and morbidity process, but nevertheless, they will be in a different place from us in six to 12 months' time. The other uh, example of this par excellence is Sweden, which has had a deliberate mitigation strategy. But I think even their infection rates are probably not as high as the US. And then you look at countries like India, whereby um, you know just controlling the virus in the way that we've tried to in Australasia is just not possible. You can't do it. And so they will walk through to some form of herd immunity. Now, as far as the herd immunity, I'm assuming, as are many of us, that the virus will convey some herd immunity that's lasting amongst the population. That may not be exactly correct, but there will be some immunity that lasts for some period of time for the majority of people infected. So uh, just quickly, uh, Tony, what happens if we do get a vaccine? Because we have seen wealthier nations just locking up more than a billion doses of potential vaccines. What if the emerging developing nations don't get it? I, can you still ease travel restrictions at that point? Well, that's a complex situation that we're yet to see unfold. Um, I hope, as do most world leaders, that the vaccine um, will be made available as quickly as possible to as many countries. It will then need to be prioritised. Presumably, it will try to be sent to those countries that have the highest pressing need. Um, and that, if, for example, from New Zealand's point of view, they may be low down the list because they're living without the virus, so they don't have a pressing need for it. Once the um, vaccine starts to roll out, this is assuming we get a vaccine, of course, then that will mean that countries will become far more comfortable about opening up their borders to others once they've both been vaccinated.